Today we're going to look at the ideas of Friedrich Nietzsche, a German philosopher from the late 1800s. We're going to be considering his ideas through the lens of what he considered his masterpiece, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Alright, so a little bit of background about Nietzsche before we proceed. Okay, his father was a Lutheran minister and little Nietzsche would go to the Bible study and learn all the Bible verses and friends in the neighborhood called him a little pastor. His father died when Nietzsche was very young. This arguably had a tremendous impact on him over the rest of his life. He got a scholarship to study, study at a private school where he studied not only the Bible, but also the classics of ancient Greece, including the works of Homer. This influenced his thinking greatly as he developed. His first works were an analysis of ancient Greek tragedy. But as he progressed in his thinking, he was certainly influenced by the ideas of the time. The major themes of the late 1800s being the rise of Marxism and revolutionary socialist thinking, as well as the advent of Darwinism and the consequences of the theory of evolution. What Nietzsche's ideas represent is a counterpoint to a lot of the ideas going on at the time. Nietzsche believed that we would be best to return to an ancient Greek ideal. You can see a lot of his ideas in the works of Aristotle. You can also see a certain amount of Stoicism in his thinking. But Nietzsche also added some of his own ideas to the history of Western philosophy and psychology, including his work on the way that human beings think, and in contrast to the Enlightenment philosophers, Nietzsche believed that there was a lot more of irrational motivations going on with human beings. Okay, so here's an overview of the major concepts we're going to be looking at today. As I mentioned previously, the theory of evolution plays a significant role in Nietzsche's thinking. With Darwin's ideas, we have this notion that we have evolved from lower beings. And the question for Nietzsche is, will we continue to progress or not? And what can we do about that? Nietzsche famously has stated that God is dead, so we see an anti-metaphysical philosophy presented. There is some analysis of human psychology and motivation and what needs to be done in order to achieve virtue, as Aristotle would say. Nietzsche controversially presents us with the positive aspects of war and discusses the notion of will to power as an essential ingredient for life. Nietzsche will an analyze the problem of pity and resentment as evidenced by the Marxist attitude. Nietzsche embraces moral relativism. And lastly, we will look at his idea of amor fati, or love of fate, and how it ties into this notion of the eternal recurrence. So, Thus Spoke Zarathustra is unique among Nietzsche's texts in that it is not academic in nature. It tells the story of a man who goes into the mountains for 10 years to be alone and contemplate life. And after 10 years, he realizes that he's learned enough about reality and he needs to bring his knowledge down to the people. So he goes back to the community and begins to preach his message. And there are challenges to his ideas and he ha gets into philosophical arguments and that is how the philosophy of Nietzsche is presented in this text. For more understanding of Nietzsche, it is definitely recommended to look at his other texts wherein he cites philosophers by name talking about the problem of Socrates, the problems of Plato, 
the good and bad ideas behind people like Kant. But since Nietzsche said he considers this his masterwork, let us do our best to understand him from this text. One of the major ideas of Nietzsche's philosophy is what we can call the overman, the German Ubermensch. Nietzsche's Zarathustra says, I teach you the overman. Man is something that shall be overcome. What have you done to overcome him? All beings so far have created something beyond themselves. And do you want to be the ebb of this great flood and even go back to the beasts rather than overcome man? What is ape to man? A laughing stock or a painful embarrassment? And man shall be just that for the overman, a laughing stock or a painful embarrassment. So, we have the theory of evolution, and Nietzsche is asking can we improve? Can we go forward? Can we become more than just man? Can we become the overman? Nietzsche has a hope for us that we can improve. But at the same time, he is worried. In contrast to the overman of the future, Nietzsche is worried about the last man. Zarathustra says, let me speak to them of what is most contemptible, but that is the last man. We have invented happiness, say the last men, and they blink. The last men are happy, content, at ease with the world. They no longer have to struggle anymore. Everything is relatively taken care of. The standard of living for everybody is relatively comfortable and they live at peace. For some people, this is the dream. Wouldn't it be fantastic if there was no more poverty, if there was no more suffering, if everybody could have a nice existence? For Nietzsche, this is not a good idea. What would happen if everything was comfortable, if everyone was at peace? We would devolve. We would no longer be men. We would turn into pathetic beings. I can't help but think of the little toys in the movie Toy Story who just sit there in the, in the toy dispensary machine and just say ooh the claw and they kind of just happily sit there going through each day in a bit of a trance. One has one's little pleasure for the day and one's little pleasure for the night but one has a regard for health. The last man no longer does anything impressive the last man has their small pleasures, their small efforts, but at the end of the day, nothing is really too stressful, nothing is really too difficult, and things are relatively easy for them. This would make men uninteresting. Zarathustra says, the time has come for man to set himself a goal. The time has come for man to plant the seed of his highest hope. His soil is still rich enough. But one day this soil will be poor and domesticated and no tall tree will be able to grow in it. What Nietzsche sees with the modern era towards a higher standard of living and comfort is a problem. If everything is taken care of, if there isn't too much struggle, then we will no longer have to push harder to make something happen. Alas, the time is coming when man will no longer shoot the arrow of his longing beyond man, and the string of his bow will forgotten how to whir. Great human beings set goals for themselves which they know will last longer than their own lifetimes. They have far-reaching ideas and a far-reaching vision and they push for that long-term goal. 
The last man is no longer concerned with this. The last man has a little pleasure for the day and a little pleasure for the night. And nothing really interesting ever happens. Nietzsche wants us to resist the urge to be comfortable and have small short-term goals. Nietzsche wants to push us to the state of the overman where your goals are beyond yourself. As Zarathustra is giving his speech, he is interrupted by the performance of a tightrope walker. This, of course, is a literary metaphor for Nietzsche's idea about man being a bridge from here to the overman. But it is interesting that during this performance, this tightrope walker is interrupted by a fool who starts to jump on the rope, causing the tightrope walker to fall down and sustain a fatal injury. As he's lying there dying, Zarathustra comes up to con comfort him, and the tightrope walker is worried that he's going to go to hell. He says, I've long known that the devil would trip me. Now he will drag me to hell. Would you prevent him? By my honor, friend, answered Zarathustra, all of that which you speak does not exist. There is no devil and no hell. Your soul will be dead even before your body. Fear nothing further. The man looked up suspiciously. If you speak the truth, he said, I lose nothing when I lose my life. I'm not much more than a beast that has been taught to dance by blows and a few meager morsels. By no means, said Zarathustra. You have made danger your vocation. There is nothing contemptible in that. Now you perish of your own vocation. For that I will bury you with my own hands. After letting the tightrope walker know that he respects him for dying by his own virtue and letting him know not to worry about hell because hell is not a real thing, Zarathustra brings the tightrope walker to the woods to bury him. Now this story about the tightrope walker introduces of course Nietzsche's idea about the overman. It also suggests the fact that there are people out there who might try to trip up the overman. Okay, but we also see an anti-metaphysical philosophy. As Nietzsche Zarathustra puts it, the overman is the meaning of the earth. Let your will say, the overman shall be the meaning of the earth. I beseech you, my brothers, remain faithful to the earth, and do not believe those who speak to you of otherworldly hopes. Here, of course, we see Plato pointing to the heavens, the metaphysical realm of forms. This is something Nietzsche believes has been a horrible distortion of thinking, that any sort of metaphysics, afterlife, another world, not only misleads us into thinking about things that aren't real, but it distorts our perception of what we should prioritize in life. And as Aristotle is depicted here, putting the brakes on this metaphysics and being more oriented towards the real world. Because for Nietzsche, this is the only world that is truly existing. Of course, in addition to the Platonic metaphysical tradition, there is the religious tradition that comes with metaphysics. Zarathustra is clear. Poison mixers are they, whether they know it or not. Despisers of life are they, decaying and poisoning themselves, of whom the earth is weary. So let them go. Nietzsche is now making a psychological point about metaphysics. If you think there is another world that is more important than this world, this is going to poison your attitude towards the world we live in. If heaven and hell are more real than this earth, then you will denigrate this earth and not give it its true respect. In this context, I cannot help but think of the suicide bomber 
who thinks that they are getting into paradise by killing themselves for their cause. This is poisonous thinking. Best to correct it. And if not, then the earth should somehow let them go. Once again, we have Nietzsche's criticism of religious and philosophical metaphysics. Nietzsche calls certain people preachers of death. And the earth is full of those whom one must preach the renunciation of life. The earth is full of the superfluous. Life is spoiled by the all too many. May they be lured from this life with the eternal life. Nietzsche is here being aggressively sarcastic towards those people who would rather be in heaven. Go ahead, Nietzsche would say. Feel free at any time. Okay? Again, this is this notion that thinking about metaphysics and an afterlife can cause a poisoned perspective on reality. Nietzsche says this is all we have. We should respect it for what it is. Just to hammer this point home, we see this section on the despisers of the body. The awakened and knowing say, body am I entirely and nothing else. And soul is only a word for something about the body. The body is a great reason, a plurality with one sense, a war and a peace, a herd and a shepherd. An instrument of your body is also your little reason, which you call spirit, a little instrument and toy of your great reason. Behind your thoughts and feelings, my brother, there stands a mighty ruler, an unknown sage whose name is Self. In your body he dwells. He is your body. What we have in this passage is... First of all, an obvious anti-metaphysical position about the soul. There is no soul that lives on after death. But beneath that, there is this more interesting analysis of human psychology. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Sigmund Freud, who was influenced by Nietzsche's ideas. With Freud, there are at least three layers to the human mind. The id, the ego, the superego. The id, your carnal impulses. The brute animalistic side of yourself which wants to be aggressive or sexual. And these urges must be repressed in some way for you to be civilized. The superego is the voice of civilization, the, the voice of morality or in some sense, the voice of your father telling you, behave yourself, keep yourself in check. The ego is the middle position between superego and id. And the ego has to do this delicate balancing act between primal urges and the voice of reason. This notion that there is this internal struggle between brute, primal, self, maybe even your animalistic, ape-like self in conflict with the voice of reason, the voice of authority, is something that is articulated with Freud, but you see the roots of it in Nietzsche's description of human psychology. This is certainly a legacy of Darwinism, coming to terms with the fact that we are evolved from animals, this is also a marked contrast to the Enlightenment idea of human beings as rational beings are all capable of reason. We all do things for reasons and so forth. What Nietzsche is gesturing towards is the idea that there is a dark side to the human mind that must be dealt with. Here we see Nietzsche's Aristotelian influence. My brother, if you have a virtue and she is your virtue, then you have her in common with nobody. Then speak and stammer, this is my good, this I love, it pleases me wholly. Thus alone do I want the good. 
I do not want it as divine law. I do not want it as human statute and need. It shall not be a signpost for me to over earths and paradises. It is an earthly virtue that I love. There is little prudence in it, and least of all the reason of all men. But this bird built its nest with me. Therefore, I love it and caress it. Now it dwells with me, sitting on its golden eggs. Thus you shall stammer and praise your virtue. Like Aristotle, Nietzsche believes we all have something we can call our own. And there's not one answer for everybody. We don't want everybody to have the same virtues, to excel at the same skills. So find the thing that you do well and protect it and nourish it and work on that project that you do well at. And don't expect other people to understand it, but stick to your guns. Here we see a little bit more of this pre-Freudian psychology. Once you had wild dogs in your cellar, but in the end they turned into birds and lovely singers. Out of your poisons you brewed your balsam. Meaning, you have these negative thoughts in your head, you have these dark sides to yourself, you can figure out a way to transform that into something positive and or creative. My brother, are war and battle evil? But this evil is necessary. Necessary are the envy and mistrust and calumny among your virtues. Behold each of your virtues and how they covet what is highest. Each wants your whole spirit that it might become her herald. Each wants your whole strength and wrath, hatred and love. Man is something that must be overcome. And therefore you shall love your virtues for you will perish of them. Nietzsche is aggressively individualistic. He believes that the social superego, as we might call it, is always trying to get you to conform to its standard of virtue and value. In this sense, Nietzsche and Rand have a lot in common. Nietzsche encourages us to break the table of values. The breaker, the lawbreaker, is the creator. Fellow creators, the creator seeks those who write new values on new tablets. Nietzsche is trying to inspire us to be ourselves. And to some extent, his ideas have taken hold in modern American culture. This idea that we are all unique in some way, that we all have something to offer to the world. That being said, Nietzsche wants to warn us that this will, should not be easy to achieve our individuality, that we'll have to work for it. This is one part of the lesson of Zarathustra and Nietzsche that is sometimes lost on the generation which believes they are all special and unique and worthy of attention. If you're going to become an overman, if you're going to be better than the average person, if you're going to have something unique about yourself which is worthy of taking note of, you have to make the three metamorphoses. You must become a camel, a lion, and a child. You must be a camel in order to bear the hardships of life. It's not going to be easy. You will have to struggle to get what you want, but you have to be able to deal with it. Furthermore, you must have the childlike quality, the naive innocence that things are possible, that you can look at things with a fresh perspective, that you don't take things too seriously, and that you have a willingness to experiment with thinking and being. If you do choose to follow a unique path, be prepared for opposition. You must take on the spirit of the lion to know when you have to roar in the face of your opponent and hold true to what you believe in. To lure many away from the herd, for that I have come. The people and the herd shall be angry with me. Zarathustra wants to be called a robber by the shepherds. 
Now there are a lot of strange passages that leave a lot of room for interpretation in this text. Here's another one to think about on the tree and the mountainside. It is by invisible hands that we are bent and tortured worst. But it is with man as it is with the tree. The more he aspires to the height and light, the more strongly do his roots strive earthward, downward, into the dark, the deep, into evil. Nietzsche suggesting a couple things here. First of all, there are invisible hands that are bending and torturing us things we are not even aware of that are manipulating us that we have to struggle against. Furthermore, in order to do well at something, we must take on some aspect of darkness or evil to achieve what we want. Now, is Nietzsche being deliberately playful here, intentionally mysterious, or does he honestly believe in order to achieve something, we have to take on some element of evil. You could respond to that by saying, well, who defines what evil is? Remember, with Rand, we are taught that the culture of altruism believes that selfishness is evil. Well, Nietzsche is, has that same line of thought. Nietzsche does not think that being selfish is evil necessarily, but of course there are the invisible hands of society that might think otherwise. Nietzsche is challenging us to be willing to do what we have to, regardless of how other people think about us, in order to become overmen. At this point we have to give a little historical context. Okay, we have discussed the philosophical background, the classical Greek ideals, the Christian heritage. Then you have the 1800s with its theory of evolution from Charles Darwin and all the ideas that evolve out of that. But we need to say a few words about nationalism and militarism. Here are some soldiers from the Franco-Prussian War of 1870 to 1871. Nietzsche served as an ambulance orderly during this brief war between France and Prussia, modern day Germany. This was the first war to feature a machine gun and Prussia under Otto von Bismarck caused a lot of death on the battlefield. Nietzsche as an ambulance order for the Prussian army would take wounded soldiers from the battlefield on the train back to the hospital. These experiences shaped his thinking. They also arguably impacted his health. After the experiences on the battlefield, his health was never the same. He had insomnia and different illnesses. In the years that follow Nietzsche's writings, his ideas became distorted and unfortunately adopted by Hitler and the Nazis of Germany. Now, what is there in Nietzsche's ideas that could lead to Nazi philosophy? Of course, the notion of the overman, the advanced person, could be thought of as somehow genetically advanced. And this is something that the Nazis took on board. Also, you see in Nietzsche an advocation for war. Okay, And we're going to look at some of his remarks on war, as we've seen already, about how War and conflict are necessary for becoming an overman. That being said, Nietzsche disliked nationalism. He believed that 
falling in love with the government and state power and rallying behind a flag was a crudity fit for lower human beings. Also, while Nietzsche dislikes religion generally, in his remarks about Judaism, he said at one point that Israel, the Jews, deserve their own country, that their culture is the world's oldest culture and is worthy of respect for being the world's oldest culture. So, clearly, based on what he said, there is no anti-Semitism in Nietzsche's philosophy. But if you pick and choose things that he said about the overman and the value of war and his remarks against socialism, you could get into a very distorted view which could end up in a Nazi way of thinking. You say it is the good cause that hollows even war? I say unto you, it is the good war that hollows any cause. War and courage have accomplished more great things than love of the neighbor. Not your pity, but your courage has so far saved the unfortunate. Of course, we can take these top two quotes out of context and justify militarism for the sake of militarism. War justifies and hollows any cause. What Nietzsche is talking about here is about you as an individual. That if you have to struggle for something, then it makes the thing you're struggling for worth it. And regarding pity... You don't get anywhere by feeling bad for yourself. You have to have the courage to know what you have to do to improve your life and push forward and struggle against the odds and make things happen. Feeling pity for yourself, feeling, feeling pity for others is not going to do anybody any good. You have to have the courage to stand up and go for it. Now, as I said earlier, there was a Marxist revolution going on throughout Europe. Many people were reading the Communist Manifesto, or talking about the ideas of Marx, and asserting that there should be an overthrow of the capitalist system, a redistribution of wealth, and that the masses should be treated better. Nietzsche believed this to be a bad way of thinking. At one point in one of his texts, he calls socialists rabid dogs, anarchist dogs in the streets who bear their fangs looking for blood. And in a certain sense, there is that spirit of animosity in the communist Marxist mindset. This is something Nietzsche is uncomfortable with and wants us to realize is a bad thing. Before the Leninist overthrow of Russia in 1917 and the following fascist Stalinism, state totalitarianism, Nietzsche perceived with the rise in democratic thinking, with the rise in the masses wanting to take control of power, this new nationalism that was emerging in the late 1800s and saw it as a danger. State is the name of the coldest of all cold monsters. Coldly it tells lies too, and this lie crawls out of its mouth. I, the state, am the people. That is a lie. It was creators who created peoples and hung a faith and a love over them. Thus they served life. The state is the new idol, the new god. Now that God is dead, we all worship at the altar of the government. We believe that our government leaders are somehow divine and that rallying around the flag and rallying behind a national cause gives our lives meaning and purpose. This is a horrible way of thinking for Nietzsche. All too many were born. For the superfluous, the state was invented. 
It will give you everything if you will adore it, this new idol. Thus it buys the splendor of your virtues in the look of your proud eyes. It would use you as bait for the all too many. Nietzsche, being an individualistic philosopher just like Rand, believes that nationalism, rallying behind the government, government power are all dangerous forces bearing down on the individual. This sign I give you. Every people speaks its tongue of good and evil, which the neighbor does not understand. It has invented its own language of customs and rights. But the state tells lies in all the tongues of good and evil. And whatever it says, it lies. And whatever it has, it has stolen. Everything about it is false. Verily, it beckons the preachers of death. Now, is this the kind of thing you would expect from a pro-Nazi philosopher? Absolutely not. This is the kind of thing that you could see Nietzsche almost predicting the horrors of Nazism, the horrors of the Soviet gulag, right? Under 20th century totalitarianism, the state is everything, the individual is nothing. If you don't agree with what the state does, they send you to death, they send you to a work camp, you become a nothing to them. Nietzsche is very much concerned with the rallying around the flag, the nationalism, and would be horrified to find out that after his death, his sister promoted his ideas as pro-Nazi philosophy, and at one point his sister posed with a picture at the Nietzsche archives with Hitler himself. There can be no doubt that even though there are elements of aggressive, individualistic, overman thinking in his ideas, he would never endorse state-sanctioned murder, torture, work camps, concentration camps, state-sanctioned terrorism, etc. Nietzsche is an individualistic philosopher who rejects nationalism. And the lessons he learned on the battlefield in the Franco-Prussian War were that these poor soldiers were dying for something that they had no connection to. They got all excited about some war because they read some article in the paper and they rush off to the battlefield and now they were all shot to shreds or they have some horrible illness. This is the tragedy of the modern era. An idea we can ascribe to Nietzsche's individualistic philosophy is moral relativism. As Zarathustra puts it, men gave themselves all their good and evil. Verily, they did not take it, they did not find it, nor did it come to them as a voice from heaven. Only man placed values in things to preserve himself. He alone created a meaning for things, a human meaning. This is my way, where is yours? Thus I answered those who asked me, the way. For the way, that does not exist. Thus spoke Zarathustra. Nietzsche and Rand are very similar in a lot of ways, but one element in which they are slightly different is in their psychology. Rand believes we are all rational, that we should do things for reasons and logic. Nietzsche agrees to some extent Remember, we have wild dogs in our cellars that we have to turn into brewing balsam, okay? We have our little reason and our great reason. And here we have this passage which says, One ought to hold on to one's heart, for if one lets it go, one soon loses control of the head too. Okay, we have the heart and we have the head. Nietzsche doesn't want us to be overly intellectual. We have to be in touch with our spirit, with our little reason and our great reason. 
But Nietzsche also doesn't want us to be pulled around by our sympathies, our pities, our compassion, and our, and our feelings. We have to keep our feelings in check as well. We have to keep our wits about us. This is leading into a commentary that Nietzsche has about the socialist, altruistic mindset. Now, Rand calls altruism illogical for her own set of reasons. What Nietzsche is talking about in his critique of altruism socialism is not so much that it is illogical, but that it is too emotional, right? We all feel bad for people when things are going wrong for them. It's a natural emotion. But we can't have a bleeding heart for everybody all the time. Because of course there's suffering in the world. Of course people are struggling. Of course there are people who are doing worse than we are. But if we let that overwhelm our thinking, we will have problems. Nietzsche characterizes the socialistic, compassionate impulse as resulting from pity. He says, Alas, where in the world has there been more folly than among the pitying? And what in the world has caused more suffering than the folly of the pitying? Woe to all those who love without having a height that is above their pity. You don't have to feel bad for people. They can figure it out themselves. Feeling bad for them is just a useless emotion which you must figure out a way to transform into something positive. That being said, Nietzsche is ultimately an antisocial philosopher. As he says it on the rabble, life is a well of joy, but where the rabble drinks to, all wells are poisoned. Nietzsche believes that most people are leaning towards being last men. Most people are in the herd. Most people are just in the crowd laughing at the jester who makes the tightrope walker fall to his death. Most people think everything is just a joke and nothing is really worth taking seriously. Most people have poisoned the well of life by feeling pity and resentment towards everything. Nietzsche believes that we have to elevate ourselves from the herd. We have to get away from the crowd because the crowd is poisoning our culture. You higher men, overcome the small virtues, the small prudences, the grain of sand consideration, the ant's riffraff, the wretched contentment, the happiness of the greatest number. This is one of the few academic references in Zarathustra. Nietzsche is here alluding to John Stuart Mill's philosophy that we should be concerned with the greatest good for the greatest number. For Nietzsche, this is the philosophy of an ant hill, right? The ants care about the greatest good for the greatest number. But we are human beings. We are beyond group thinking and herd mentality. We have to be better than that. We have to be higher than that. Nietzsche is individualistic, but we could go further and say that Nietzsche is elitist in his thinking. He believes some people are better than others. And this is not something that we should feel ashamed of or embarrassed about because for Nietzsche's antisocial way of thinking, most people are devolving. Again, the poisonous thinking of the socialist. Nietzsche calls them tarantulas. You preachers of equality, to me you are secretly vengeful. We seek, we shall wreak vengeance and abuse on all whose equals we are not. Thus do the tarantulas vow, and they lurk in their den with their poison, looking to put venom in someone who thinks that they're better than them. The socialist resents successful individuals. The socialists want us to all be equal, and this is poisonous thinking. 
For to me, justice speaks thus. Men are not equal, nor shall they become equal. Some people are better than others at certain things. If somebody is a better musician, a better artist, a scientist, doctor, engineer, architect, writer, they are better at something than somebody else. They are unequal to others. Now, do we all have equal rights to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? Sure. Okay, are we all equal in that legalistic sense? Fine. But do we all deserve the same paycheck, standard of living, house, car, etc.? For Nietzsche, absolutely not. Some people work harder to achieve their virtues and deserve what they get for their efforts. And if you don't work hard to achieve your virtues, you don't deserve the same standard of living as someone who has become successful. The successful overman has had to incorporate the will to power in their life. They have had to push to achieve what they've accomplished. Only where there is life is there also will. Not will to life, but thus I teach you, will to power. You have to dominate situations. You have to take control of situations. You have to assert yourself in order to be successful. Nowadays we talk about alpha males, dominating personalities. For Nietzsche, you have to become an aggressive dominating personality in some sense in order to achieve your goal. Unless, of course, your goal is a small happiness for the day, a small happiness for the night, and a concern for one's health. If you're content to be what Nietzsche calls a last man, you don't need the will to power. You can just get a regular job, have a middle class existence, and sort of have this, this medium-sized happiness, right? But if you want to push yourself to achieve something impressive, you have to have the will to power. That being said, in achieving your goal, you might fall to your death from a tightrope walker above the crowd. But this is the price you pay for becoming an overman. So Nietzsche has basically a range of choices for us. We can choose the path of the many and walk with the herd and have our small pleasures and our ants concern for the greatest good for the greatest number, potentially get wrapped up in nationalism, potentially get wrapped up into poisonous metaphysics, or we can take the path of the overman, but we must be ready to be a camel, a lion, a child, and to incorporate the will to power in our thinking. People talk a lot about freedom, right? I wish I was free to do whatever I wanted, etc. I wish I didn't have to go to work today and so forth. Zarathustra says, Free from what? As if that mattered. But your eyes should tell me brightly, Free for what? Can you give yourself your own evil and your own good and hang your own will over yourself as a law? Right? If you want freedom from having to go to work so that you can stay home and watch Netflix, then your freedom is not valuable. If you want freedom from work so that you can work on a project that you're trying to achieve in your long-term vision of goodness and virtue, then of course your freedom would be valuable for Nietzsche. So I recommended There Will Be Blood in the context of Rand's philosophy and it is certainly a relevant film in the context of Nietzsche's philosophy. What does it take for an individual to be successful? To what extent do you have to incorporate the will to power to achieve your ideal? And there is another concept in Nietzsche's philosophy which the character in this film did not realize and probably would have saved him a lot of grief if he had. And this concept comes up in a passage called On Redemption. 
As Zarathustra is going around the community preaching his message, people begin to look at him as a spiritual guide in the sense of the ancients, right? So at one point, a hunchback comes to Zarathustra and asks him to heal him of his affliction. Can you please make me better? What is Zarathustra's re response? When one takes away the hump from the hunchback, one takes away his spirit. To redeem those who lived in the past and to recreate all it was into a thus I willed it, that alone should I call redemption. This passage gestures at one of Nietzsche's very important concepts called amor fati, Latin phrase meaning love of fate. For Nietzsche, so much of what people get wrong in life is second guessing their existence of things that have happened to them, decisions they've made and so forth. Okay, maybe they were born with some physical impairment, maybe they made some mistake in life, Maybe something happened to them which they always regard as a horrible tragedy and if only things were different, life would be better. Nietzsche thinks this is the most poisonous line of thought that you can incorporate. You have to realize that everybody has something horrible happen to them. Everybody has some tragedy that occurs in their lives. And you have to accept it, not only accept it but think of it as something you wanted to happen this is of course a total distortion and a lie you have to tell yourself but if you tell yourself i wanted that bad thing to happen i wanted that horrible event to occur then you figure out a way to rationalize and make something positive out of these things in life love your fate right Think of the person who goes through their life complaining about small occurrences. Oh, if only this were different. Oh, if only that were different. Then I would be having a better day. For Nietzsche, this is just bad thinking. You have to figure out a way to say yes to life. To embrace the things as they are. If you don't like something, turn away from it. Don't bother criticizing it or talking about why you dislike it. Just focus on what you can do, what you find positive in the world. This idea is presented in what Nietzsche believed to be one of his most important ideas, the eternal recurrence. Nietzsche says, imagine if it were the case that life as you know it repeated endlessly over and over again that there was no getting off the wheel of karma, that there was no afterlife, that there's no end to life, but that when you die, you are immediately reborn again from the beginning, and everything you lived through has to happen the same exact way one more time, and again, and again, and again. This is comically portrayed in the film Groundhog Day, of course, but... Nietzsche believes that if you were presented with this as a possibility, that most people would recoil in horror. They would say, oh goodness, I would never want to live my same life over again. Think of all the horrible things that happened to me and all the horrible decisions I made. I would never want to have to go through that again. It would be terrible. What Nietzsche wants us to do is take on board this idea of love of fate, amor fati, and say, okay, I figured out a way to make my life work. I knew there were some bad things that happened and some bad circumstances, but I made it work. And therefore, if I did have to go back to the beginning, I would joyfully say once more again from the top.